Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options markets across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. Hey, this is Dan Nathan. You're listening to the podcast version of Trading Spaces. It's a live Q&A that I do with my on the tape co-host Guy Dami every Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on Twitter Spaces. We hope you enjoy this episode and thanks as always to our presenting sponsor, CME Group. All right, so this is Trading Spaces, guys. Guy and I do this every Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We're often joined by our On the Tape podcast co-host, Danny Moses, who is here right now. That podcast is sponsored by CME Group. Guy, how's that come out? Comes out CME. We used to say, you know, when it comes out. In other words, if you were trading a stock and you wanted to know, you know, what it came out, we'd say, listen, I got some Microsoft to sell. Comes out MSFT, that type Correct. of thing. Correct. Okay. So our podcast drops every Friday in the podcast stores. This last week, we had a great rundown of the volatile week that was in markets, stock markets, bond markets, commodity markets, FS markets. And then we were also joined by Ian Bremer of the Eurasia Group, who was pointing to some geopolitical hotspots. That was an awesome conversation. So check it out in the podcast stores. Follow us there. Guy, also, we have a market call update with Factset. Uh, Factset. Amanda is going to post that in the uh, feed right now. Please subscribe to that. That's Wednesday, December 8th at noon live with Guy and myself. And we have some Factset folks who are going to be joining us. John Butters, Earnings Insight. Butters, uh, some Butters, Butters is going to be us. there. So do us a favor. Join us for that. Um, we love the people at Factset. They are the sponsor of our market call on Thursdays. All right, let's get into it, folks. Um, we got to bounce. I don't think anyone thought, uh, you know, we were going to close the way we did Friday. We had that little kind of afternoon sort of, um, you know, afternoon bounce a little bit here. But we had a follow through. Guy, what's your take, Danny? What's your take? What's going on here? Because it's not just a sea of green here, people. There is some red on my screens. So I said on Fast Money about a week or so ago, I said the obvious, and I'm not trying to play Monday morning quarterback at all. I said, but an obvious place for us to stop in the S&P 500 would be the prior all-time high, which was made in September of about 45.30 or thereabouts. And look, did did it get through it? Yeah, but I mean, effectively, that's where we stopped and that's where we bounced from. So First time down, that's made sense. But to your point, and I'd love to hear what Danny has to say, you know, everybody's going to get all geeked up on Mountain Dew, the stock market, the Dow's up 700 points, and the Nasdaq's up 100 points. And But I will tell you, you're still looking at a VIX that is either side of 28 right now. And that's telling a much different story. So I'll look at the VIX and say, when the VIX crashes, all right, I'll give you all clear sign, but I don't think we're anywhere near that. And these swings... I think we're going to continue for the foreseeable future. Danny Moses. Yeah, I think the airlines were oversold. Obviously the biotech vaccine makers were overbought. So you're getting a little, you know, come back there, by the way, congratulations to the CEO of Moderna Von Sell for scaring the crap out of everybody last week and then continuing to sell stock in one of his multi 10 B five, one insider sale plans. That's a whole nother <laughs> episode, but you know, kudos to him. Um, Yeah, so I think you're just seeing a little bit of short covering. And then I think some buying on stuff that looks cheap. I think, you know, Dan had pointed out last week that the airlines were starting to look good. Things like Live Nation, you know, people want to get out and live again. But I think, listen, we got decent non-news on Omicron, meaning it doesn't look horrible. So that's good. And I think people just want to live and and do their thing. So I think you're seeing those stocks perform. But you're right. You got certain stocks that are still down on day. Market still doesn't feel great to me. Um, You know, and, and I think... Crypto kind of held here, which is probably a decent sign for retail, but still watching some of these retail heavy meme stocks. They're not doing well. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm watching a, many, many things, but I think all we're seeing today is kind of a relief rally cover. Yeah. When, you, when you say, Danny, I want to live, that uh, and that Dan's going to get mad at me, but that obviously <laughs> reminds me of Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful uh, Life at the end of the movie, I Want to Live. Sorry, Dan. 1946, if you've never seen uh, the movie, you've been living under a rock. 
And yeah, I cry I every time at the end. Live when on the first run, true. so that must That's have been true. fun for you. Yeah, it was um, fun. You know, Danny, you mentioned crypto here, and it was interesting because this morning it feels like we hadn't had Evergrande um, headlines in a while, and it looked like that that was kind of bubbling up. That finally maybe. There's a bunch of debt payments that might not be made. And every time this comes up, there's always this talk about commercial paper, um, you know, that might be in some of these stable coins, Tether in particular. Um, did any of this liquidation over the weekend, we haven't seen a weekend liquidation. And oftentimes you'll hear pointed that it's leverage and it stops being taken out and, and all that sort of stuff. Do, do, is there any connection to what's going on, do you think, Danny? Like, like, like some yeah, I think there's always, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think it's always there. Listen, Evergrande debt, which is due in two or three months, just went down to 23 cents on the dollar from 34 cents in one trading day. So we know that there's issues there. And we had another Tether at a station come out, I believe, just showing on a one page that they what they own and that they have the money. But I'm sure there's people on Twitter, if you go in, you know, down there that are talking about that stuff. So, yes, I think there is some type of down weather. How big rabbit holes down the rabbit That's hole. Big. Exactly. But it tends to coincide with that from time to time. And whatever the reason, listen, we had a big sell off all week. People could have been just raising a little bit of capital. But we yeah. know how we know how, you know, certain times the crypto market just lacks liquidity and you had like a what was it 2.4 billion dollars worth of bitcoin sold in a matter of yeah of you know hours so anyway i just don't think it's as liquid you know what's uh, funny so um that we see a lot i was down at the end of last week in miami and it was art basel but it really was taken over by nft stuff digital art and everything and oftentimes after you have those big crypto events those centralized crypto events you see sell-offs you know the enthusiasm kind of builds into it that sort of thing so I think that's kind of interesting. I do think it's interesting. Ethereum holding four thousand. Amanda will throw up a chart. Look at the high from September. That was four thousand before it had that drop back to like twenty six hundred or something like that. So it's kind of holding that line um, a little bit. Um, Bitcoin definitely got a little funky over the weekend. Um, I don't know what the low was, maybe like forty three thousand or something like that. Um, let's talk about some stocks, Danny. You just mentioned that you want to live, but um, you know I mentioned. Live Nation um, last week, American Express. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on corporate travel and travel in general. American Express, high-end spending. Those stocks look pretty decent to me um, right here. I do think it's interesting. Guy mentioned airlines. You know, they are right back towards those gap levels from when Omicron became a thing that weekend of Thanksgiving um, where they've kind of filled in those gaps. Really, really sharp moves back. Uh, CCL, DAL, UAL. Um, Air, uh, Airbnb is up nearly 9%. So anything travel related is really bouncing. Any thoughts there, guys? I mean, do they get rejected? If you look at the UAL and the DAL and the CCL, they are right back at that prior support, which is like like months and months and months of support. Do they get through that resistance now? I'll let Guy answer. But, I mean, if oil stays down here, I think they could rip a little bit more, just the transport stocks in general, so they could have some legs. It's good to see some of the retailers come back down. Like Macy's had gone up. I know they had a great quarter because they managed their inventory well. But look at that stock. Like it's, I don't expect that to re-rally again. I know you saw some activists today in retail with like coal stores and stuff. So you kind of get those one-offs. But these things would have room to run back into the you know holiday booking season for sure if things do settle down on the COVID front for sure. Yeah, my view but, on that is, you know, and, and I'm trying to be um... – Sensitive here. I mean, we, we get tasked to look at things through the prism, through the lens of the market, right? So obviously this variant is not great news for mankind. But what I point I've made on the show and I'll make here is that I think the, as a, the market has learned to deal with uh, COVID and subsequent variants, and although people will point to this variant as the reason the market sold off, yeah, that is a reason. I don't think it's the reason. I think Danny might agree with me on this one. I think it's now a Federal Reserve that has done a bit of a 180 in terms of their language. I think that's what the market, to me, is struggling with. And I think the good 6 o'clock news headline will be the variant. But the real story to me is beneath the surface. And quickly, I think it's worth mentioning, the, the ARK ETF made a 52-week low today at 89 and change. It subsequently has bounced. But if you're looking for market sentiment indicator, I think look no further than ARKK. And I think I'm really fascinated to see how Tesla closes today, which once again traded below a thousand. Dan, 
Yeah, well, the ARC thing is interesting because it's obviously fairly oversold. That low um, from May was just under 100. It kind of blasted through there. It went from 125 at the start of this month, 125 down to the low today, um, just below um, 90. And we know what the big holdings are there. And it's also important to note that when Tesla is a 10% holding of that ETF in the stock or the ETF has been acting so poorly, despite Tesla's outperformance, it tells you how horrible everything else is trading in that ETF, right? And so, and, um, yeah. And by the way, and, and Dan, since Danny's here, I'd love to hear his thoughts. But, you know, people say Michael Burry in terms of his timing is, you know, is always very early. In, in retrospect, you know, his comments about ARC, he was spot on. I mean, if you really look at it and look at a timetable, Danny. Yeah, listen, he follows liquidity. He follows liquidity traps. He knows that things can't sustain over a long period of time. I mean, he was, as we know, he was two to three years early to the mortgage because he saw it coming and he stood with it. I think we all kind of see. Well, Guy never saw the movie, Danny. Oh, yeah. He he, he doesn't. I saw the big chill. I saw it. It's great. I love Tom Berenger in that movie. Exactly. Wonderful. But, you know, listen, he's he's watching those names. He knows they're on borrowed time. But I will tell you this. One other point is that I think the two-year yield is kind of the new 10-year yield in terms of what the market's watching. And if you told me the one thing that's going to keep the market in check, it's the two year rising um, from here. And I think, yeah, it's 80 bips or 79 bips between the two and 10 and won't go into the wonkiness of that. But I think the two year people are now starting to watch because it is starting to creep into the funding markets a little bit and just makes everything else just a little bit more expensive because most loans in the consumer area, X mortgages are based on two, three, four, five years. Right. So those if those things widen up a little bit, it could back things up. So I think the two year is the new 10 as far as the obsession of watching the market. I just wanted to add that. I think you're right. And go ahead, Dan. No, I was going to say that, you know, there was there was some chatter over the weekend um, about just flows and some of these high yield ETFs. Danny, do you track those? Um, Because those would be I mean, they they definitely had some weakness over the last, um, you know, couple of weeks, but have kind of bounced back a little bit. Is that something on your radar also? Yeah, I don't think it's eminent. But yes, it is something I think that'll be the tail. But yeah, I'm just more watching right now the funding markets, which are fine. But incrementally, if you see, again, wonkiness, gain on sale margins, maybe people don't know what those are, but a lot of um, companies that are built upon financings that get funding from the markets have to sell certain loans into the marketplace. And if they change from two points or three points down, that's a direct hit to margin. So anyway, I know I'm getting too deep in the weeds here, but I'm watching that to see what happens. But no, I, think I don't we're think you're with, too deep at all. Yeah. I think that's really important. And, you know, I've, I've said this and I think – you know, Dan and I go back and forth. I think Danny's more in my camp, but the volatility we're seeing in the bond market is really problematic. And, you know, two year yields, which were what, 20 basis points, they went from basically 20 basis points to current levels in about a month and a half, two months. I mean, th- there's something, uh, something amiss in the bond market. And in the way 10 year yields trade, they trend like freaking biotech stocks. If you look, I mean, the move from 167, which was the recent high, I think down to what 133 that we trade on friday i mean and back up i mean it's it's really madness i mean 10-year yields should not trade like that in my opinion danny moses i totally agree the most liquid thing in the world should not trade well, like that well, but, but hold on yeah. but hold on uh, they're, they're trading pretty liquidy you know what i mean like they're, they're like you know if you look at the 10-year yield it's been trading a guy you've been calling him it's like this kind of pennant formation you know between like one six and 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 one two you know ish or something like that so to me i mean you know for the most part if you think about what's going on i mean the equity markets are down less than five percent now from their highs considering that you've had this move in the two-year yield that's the thing that i think is kind of off kilter but but the equity markets have not really taken its cues from the moves in the not tenure. At all. All not year. at all. So and, to me, and so I that's, think... that's why I'm not concerned about the volatility there. But in the near term, I think what the two-year yield is saying is 100% that the Fed is now totally off sides or at least playing catch up. And that's the thing that should be concerning about the equity markets because the last time the Fed was really off sides was Q4 of 2018, Guy. And what did the stock market do then? Well, it went down 19.9%, but you said they were off sides. I think they were on the right path, but that's another conversation for another time. Well, fair enough. They 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 got cut. Yeah. All right. Let's talk some stocks really quickly because we, we know we have Brady coming in 
um, at 120 to talk cannabis with Danny here. Um, you know, we're still seeing some volatility in some of these, like you guys forget the arc names, but like look at Z Scaler down 13% today. CrowdStrike, which had that horrible week, down still down two and a half percent. I mean, there's still some stocks that are NVIDIA and AMD, which have been these massive, like um, you know, outperformers in the semi space, are down both about four percent. Intel, guy, when's the last time you've seen Intel up three and a half percent, especially on the day? <laughs> when, I mean, come on, like, you know, um, what's going on in the semi space? What are we thinking in the tech? Is the, is the route over in, in a high growth, unprofitable tech and also in some of these major outperformers? We've seen it before. I think what you, you just hit the nail on the head in terms of what the market's trying to do. I think people want to stay in the space. They're taking money out of names whose valuations may not make sense in a rising interest rate environment and also stocks that have been on fire and they're, and they're sort of parking it into names where they can get sort of wrap their head around the valuation in terms of Intel, for example. By the way, Qualcomm, I think, is a valuation name that makes sense as well. I think you're seeing that to a large extent, believe it or not, in Apple. I think the broad market sell-off for the – let's put it this way. The, jitter, the jitteriness in the broader market works to Apple's advantage because people are looking at that as a flight to safety, which I find – a number of different things, a lot of which I can't say here, but I think that's what, to me, that's what's going on. Danny, thoughts here, my main man, on, on some of this tech, like, you know, like Salesforce, this is another one I think is important. Um, you know, a few, a few months ago, when Salesforce was high, it was kind of underperforming some of its peers. It was kind of trading very near the levels it was right now um, prior to its earnings. It was kind of running up. It was probably in the mid 240s or something like that. And we're looking at their kind of um, their their kind of calendar Q3 here. And I said it was one of the best looking charts in the market. If you looked at a multi year period, well, it did break out and it went, you know, it broke out at 260 and went as high as what was the high 310 or something like that. Now it came. You know, the whole way down in a very short period of time, what do they say? Uh, escalator up, elevator down here, or, or the opposite of that, I guess. Um, what's your take on some of these names where the stories are good? The second is it's just to be revalued because you're seeing decelerating metrics after a really great period, you know what I mean, over like an 18-month period. Yeah, I think people are trying to figure out what does 22 and even 23 look like. But what continues to amaze me is, these are a lot of these huge market cap companies that trade at 10, 15, 20 percent increments. To me, that's the more unsettling thing. I don't care if you're bullish or bearish. I mean, you yeah. know, those you should not have those type of moves. The market should be much more efficient. And that just tells you either there's a lot of speculation money out there that's either trying to find a home or trying to find another home. And it, that's the part that scares me the most. They just they, These things should not trade like that. So fundamentals aside, it's a little bit scary. But I think yeah, I just trying to figure it's... Yeah. Salesforce uh, caught a little support right above its 200-day moving average for any of you guys who would give a crap about that stuff. But if you draw a line from the May low, which was uh, 215 or so, and you see that Salesforce held that uptrend really beautifully and then had that massive gap in September and kept on going higher, well, look at that gap from last week right below that uptrend line, but held, holding the 200-day. So if you're looking for a level, it's kind of back to you know, where I called the most beautiful chart. <laughs> Um, in the market. You know, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking what? for that badass from the state of Florida, the guy that could have been a linebacker at a Division One school, Brady Cobb. That's what that's what I'm looking for, my man. Hey, hey, Brady, thanks for joining Trading Spaces with Guy, Danny, and myself. Danny, why don't you give him a proper intro so our audience knows who the hell Brady Cobb is rather than a guy. A man that, that needs said. no introduction. I mean, so Brady has been in the cannabis industry for years, started out as a lawyer, was a lobbyist in D.C., has been one of the – Biggest proponents for the sector for several years. His story is incredible. You can go listen to one of our episodes. We had him on about his father who was trafficking cannabis for years down in Florida. One of the original runners, I guess you could say that. And that's what kind of made Brady become a lawyer in the space and seek out justice and seek out legalization. And uh, most recently was CEO of Bluma Wellness, which he helped build into a Florida powerhouse and sold it over to Cresco Lab. So he understands the M&A. He understands the, every aspect of cannabis from legal side to the operation side. So, and he's a great guy to hang out with. And so all around cool, cool dude. And so Brady, with that introduction, if Dan thinks that's sufficient, why, that don't, why don't we, why, why don't you give us an update and kind of what's going on in DC? And uh, I know they got build back better and they got the debt ceiling issue around, but are we going to sneak this safe into this NDAA as we call it? 
Yeah, the only thing you left out of the intro is how I whipped your ass in a swim race after you told me 100% you were going to beat me. But we'll yeah, talk about that I got that you in later. tennis, though. All right, go ahead. Uh, you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, as we've talked about on a couple of, of your different podcasts uh, on, on the tape, safe's in the house version of the NDAA, which the NDAA is the must-pass defense bill. And up until last week when the Senate went full high school catfight, uh, it looked like it was going to be a must-pass bill until last week when people started going, is it even going to be able to get through the Senate? There's been a lot of squabbling. They blew a lot of time last week in the Senate, uh, kind of squabbling back and forth. There wasn't a lot of control of the chamber. Uh, so we you know, definitely ran into the overall so, uh, process for the NDAA, definitely hit a speed bump last week, which as you compare that to some of the initiatives they have to get done over the next, call it three weeks before they – adjourn for the holidays, hopefully for them, is they've got to deal with debt ceiling, which I don't want, you know, Danny, you could talk about that a lot better than me. They have to deal with the hallmark initiative of President Biden, which is the Build Back Better uh, bill, both of which are slated to be addressed this year. So that really puts some downward pressure on trying to get forward, get something done with safe. So what happened over the weekend, as I tweeted about earlier today, is the House Armed Services uh, Committee staff worked with the Senate Armed Services Committee staff over the weekend looking to do what's called an informal conference. Uh, Generally, when you're passing legislation, there's a House version, a Senate version, there's a conference process where they negotiate for a little bit of time. The members do directly cut to a final version. That's what the president passes. That's when things are functioning well and everyone's getting along. That's not D.C., as I think we, we all have seen every day on the news cycle. So to try to make sure they meet the deadline Staff did a lot of that work over the weekend, and I expect you're going to see kind of a flurry of activity over the next 72 hours, where we'll likely see the House uh, Rules Committee will look to pass out their conference version, which, remember, the House version does have safe banking in it, uh, based on these informal, what they call ping pong negotiations back and forth, where they're literally just bouncing the bills and the different provisions and reconciling the different provisions back and forth between the two chambers. You'll see the House probably call theirs up later today or early tomorrow. Uh, to to go through the rules committee and ultimately to a floor vote. You'll see the Senate follow thereafter, and we should be looking at a final piece of legislation. It'll be remain to be seen. I believe it will be included. It's already in the House version. I will. It should be in that version that goes out of the rules committee from the House. Remember, Representative Pearl Mutter, who's the sponsor and largely a, a tremendous champion for the legislation and cannabis reform. He is on that rules committee in the House. He was the one that was able to get it included in the House version of the NDAA to begin with. And then it's going to come down to whether somebody wants to publicly kill it in the Senate. There is not a rules committee in the Senate, uh, so it would have to be killed by an individual member as part of the process. So if if you've been paying attention over the last week, I mean, labor unions came out and wrote a letter in support of the Safe Banking Act. You have a bipartisan group largely led by Democrats of the Senate Armed Services Committee have come out in support. Real estate agents, bankers, uh, uh, a whole host of folks have come out. Multiple different uh, minority and social equity access groups have sent, come out and written letters in support of SAVE saying uh, it will help the access to capital for these new startup social equity uh, market entrants. You've seen, you know, even for me as someone that's been a part of this process since 2016, it's, it's very humbling and it's very amazing to see the level of support that's been kind of flying in by via letter or direct meetings. And the question is, is, is will uh, Senator Schumer or Majority Leader Schumer or Senator Booker or Senator Widener or some of the other leaders over there, will they really be willing to stand in the way of this bill moving forward that's going to help and has so much support to try to wait for something before the midterms, which... I don't really see the feasibility of something before the midterms uh, other than safe. It, it's just this is such a hyper-partisan environment, especially heading into these contentious midterms. It's kind of they got to win. So, Are they going to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory? Brady, so just for the people on this call that aren't cannabis people per se, so the SAFE Act is the um, uh, Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act. This has been around since 2019. It has passed through the House five times. The reason that Schumer and Booker have been kind of hesitant to do it is they're trying to get a more comprehensive bill done that has social justice, criminal justice, which is great. States are doing that anyway. And the reason we brought up this HOPE Act um, that a few people have introduced with bipartisan support is it hopefully gives Senator Booker and Schumer the cover, say, okay, here's an expungement, which is what it does on the state level, allows for expungements, which could get this thing in here. I think the last thing, Brady, I think to comment on, SAFE will get done, and we hope it's now. But if it doesn't, it should get done in the first quarter. It just has too much support to it. 
And I don't think people understand the cost of capital perspective. If you're not following cannabis per se, just think of it as a normal business, but you aren't able to expense certain items or you can't run your payroll or you have to keep cash and you're using Brinks trucks still. I mean, it's, it's incredibly unsafe. It's incredibly inefficient. And I, incredibly. And I think, and the other thing I'll draw is that of course the exchanges are looking for an excuse to uplist these U S MSOs, these multi-state operators that trade on the junior exchanges in Canada all we're stuck here with on the listings, for the most part, are the Canadian names, which really are just trading as a as story stocks and cannabis, not on valuation. And so this thing could really you you talk about a catalyst. We talk on our show all the time. What stocks could we buy? What this is a revaluation opportunity. We're all hoping it's in the next few weeks. But at the very least, I think you would agree it was not the next few weeks. It's in the next few months. There's just too much support for it. And it's, this thing just has to go. You agree with that? What? Yeah, it's, it's when not if uh, the Hope Act was Representative Dave Joyce and AOC. Uh, that's something, that type of initiative, the state-based expungements, because that's one of the big misnomers. Senator Schumer and Senator Booker's bill was very much focused on criminal justice. And as someone whose father experienced it, my family experienced it, I share the passion, but it's about accomplishing something in D.C. It's taken the little wins. Ultimately, the HOPE Act is the pathway. It will get 90% of the convictions in the United States for cannabis-related offenses are at the state level. Waving a federal wand won't get those people out of jail or won't get their records expunged. What the HOPE Act does is it will actually empower the states to go do their jobs in their own state-based criminal justice systems. In Senator Booker's home state of New Jersey, the governor accomplished that with one stroke of his pen. I mean, it was incredible. But talking about what this will do for the marketplace as a guy who's operated a vertically integrated business in this space at a high level, it's tremendous. Your insurance cost comes down. Your health care cost comes down ultimately you're going to have access to low cost capital, kind of non-predatory private debt market capital. And we have the opportunity to actually list these companies in the United States and access U.S. investors and U.S. funds in a real way instead of having to go through our friends up in Canada. So it would be a significant re-rate. It will be the pathway. And by the way, the most important thing, if you are truly want to empower the people that have been harmed by this war on drugs the most, you got to you got to do it with our wallets and you got to do it by getting them access to capital to start their businesses, because otherwise this goes to do a startup social equity license in the state of New York. The capital rates for that startup owner is going to are going to be ridiculous. The, the cost of capital safe banking will get them an access point into more traditional capital and not get them out of these private debt markets. So it, it, it's a huge Brady rebate. Cobb, big fan of your work. Guy Adami here, by the way, as you know, I totally dig you and I'm not looking to play stock market here, but. Are there names that people like under the radar screen that we should be watching that don't get? I mean, we know the obvious names, but are there things that people don't talk enough about that you're watching? Yeah, I mean, I'm. I if you look at the space, I'm a big fan. Obviously, the big, the big ones, the GTIs, the Cure Leafs. The, I'm a big fan. I don't think they get enough attention of Verano. Uh, they're incredible operators. If you look at what they did in their most recent quarterlies, I mean, they they threw out over a hundred million bucks of EBITDA. Uh, they, they had the highest EBITDA number. They had, you know, they didn't have the highest top line revenue, but they had the highest EBITDA. They run a very efficient business. I'm a fan of MSOS, which is the ETF, uh, which Danny and I have talked about on, on a few of the, your guys' programs before. I, I think it's a great way for people to take a speak at the space. Hydro Farm, I think is a great one. They're, they're an ancillary products provider. They're traded, I believe, on NYSE. Um, they are a very big provider of all of the products needed to run a cannabis business. We use them at Bluma. Uh, so all of the, all the growing equipment, all the fertilizers, the feeds, and as this business continues to increase, you're going to see that be something that is going to be needed to scale. So I think those are some good names and, and you know, you can't, you can't sleep on the GTIs of the world. I mean, look at what that company is doing nine quarters in a row of positive net income. And then you look at a company like Cresco, I'd, I'd keep an eye on Cresco labs too, based on their ability to. They've really focused on wholesale, which I think if you believe this is going to be a truly disruptive CPG moment like I do, the ability to have that wholesale distribution model ironed out is going to be critical. So those are some good names to keep. Let me just throw one more in there. Hey, Dan, let me just throw one more in there. This weed weed maps, you know, MAPS. I mean, the stock's gotten drilled because they missed numbers out of the gate because they were a SPAC. But don't sleep on that one. That is the Yelp slash Google of the space. They're profitable. They have cash on the balance sheet. And it's not getting grouped in. It's not really in. It's in CNBS is one of the ETFs that's out there. But I'd look at that thing, too. So if you're looking for buying opportunities. Sorry, Dan, yeah, go ahead. Sh- sh- no, shout out to CNBS. It's our friend Tim Seymour's um, actively managed. Tim Seymour, too. Yeah, yep. actively managed yep. um, uh, cannabis ETF. Brady, why do you think this sentiment is so bad in the stock? So, so I, I'm, I, I listen. I listen to you and Danny and, and Tim, and and I follow space. Uh, I've been known to like the products. Um, 
you know, it, it's as an investor, I think a lot of investors got sucked in, right? They were like, oh, this is going to be the next thing. And then it was this this investment bubble, at least in the equity market. So I know Danny will tell us, oh, you're looking at the wrong things. But now a lot of these equities or a lot of these ETFs are off 50% from their highs earlier this year. And it looks like there's some pretty identifiable catalysts. And then when you call this a consumer products play, it seems like, Oh my goodness, if you do get the safe banking, right, this is going to be a massive consumer story. Why do the stocks that at least that are listed here, why do they trade so badly? And why do investors seem indifferent to them right now? Well, I think one of the biggest things is access points. So these, these, these you got to look at the plumbing first and kind of work your way backwards. We're, we're traded on the CSE for the most part, which is incredibly inefficient as well as the OTC markets because of that Schedule 1 designation. And we all hope that safe banking is that springboard with updated FinCEN guidance to get us on the U.S. exchanges because the, the U.S. exchanges certainly want to list these companies. There's no reason for U.S. companies serving U.S. people to be traded in another country except for this, this silly Schedule 1 designation. I think the second piece of it is is there was such a front run, as you kind of see in any nascent market, where you've got some, you know, there's some businesses that are built on sand instead of being built on, you know, bedrock. And I think some of those might have spooked some people in the early days. But I would tell you, a lot of people have also pinned a lot of the hopes on a big federal catalyst. Uh, and look, I've been pushing, that's been, I jumped into the federal lobbying game on this uh, back in 16 because I noticed and realized very quickly that it was either going to be our single biggest headwind or tailwind. And as Tim Seymour and I have written about quite a bit in op eds, it's proven thus far to be a, a, a headwind. But what you can't remember or you can't forget is even amidst having draconian tax rates, I mean, north of 60 percent tax rates on these cannabis companies in the U.S., having high cost of capital, having to pay almost double for normal services like insurance and everything else because you're Schedule 1. These companies, the, the big ones we just talked about, are still throwing off solid EBITDA numbers, ridiculous EBITDA margins, ridiculous margins and generating positive net cash in spite of that federal law overhang. That can't be understated. And if it, it's been choppy waters, but I think you could look at almost any nascent market that's on its way up and see that it, there's going to be choppy waters. And as you look at these first set of kind of federal catalysts coming and the move towards, you know, CPG is paying close attention. You see these alcohol companies, they're all doing deals in the cannabis. The cigarette companies are going to be behind them. And as soon as pharma can jump in, they're all going to be jumping in because this is a disruptive category. And if you're an alcohol company, nobody wants to let seltzer happen again. They're all coming. Yeah. And I would add to that, that it's been, a, you know, trying to buy these stocks have been difficult. Sometimes trying to sell the stocks is difficult because there's clearing companies that, that stopped clearing at certain times. There's been a lot of false starts, but, you know, they're not easy to trade. They're expensive to trade. But for what could be a 200, 300 percent return we're looking at here, you know, over the next year, possibly, I think that they're, you know, buy and hold from here and, and buy on dips, in my opinion. Hey, Brady, let me ask yeah, you, go long. Brady, let me ask you a question. So my twin brother, you, you know, that was a great point you just made that none of these alcohol companies want another seltzer thing to happen. So my twin brother lives in Boulder and, you know, uh, cannabis is legal in Boulder and you go in, it's not a particularly um, good consumer experience going into the dispensary. I've done it in California. I've done it in Colorado. Um, you know, it just doesn't feel like a, like a seamless retail experience. Um, but the bigger issue that I see is like consumer adoption is the taboo associated with smoking or eating weed because it's still a drug. And, and how long will that take? Because like, you know, people will sit around in their backyard and drink 10 beers at a barbecue with their kids, you know, running around or, or drink bottle after bottle of wine right at a dinner party with the kids over there watching a football game or something like that. But people are not like busting out the bong you know, or the pipe or anything like that, even in places where it's legal. You know what I mean? So is that taboo going to stick around for a while? And will it take like how do you get by that for like mass adoption if you do get like, you know, some sort of movement towards federally legal? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's something that, you know, there's a ton of a ton of, the, ton of these MSOs and a ton of the CPG companies that are, are all spent a lot of money on research. And, you know, I can tell you from the adoption rate in Florida and my own experiences and watching Florida grow, watching California grow and, you know, spent a lot of time in California and Colorado. You're starting to see it from where it was just the more traditional cannabis users to now. You know, I was just in a MedMen store in Venice uh, on, the, on their Abbott Kinney store and three quarters of the store were women. Uh, some of them, you know, that, that's not something you would have seen previously. 
it's just going to take a minute. It's a drip, drip, drip. And I think is more a- available means to use the product. So it's not just taking a bong, but you know, it's, it's edibles. Edibles is going to be a huge category. RTD ready to drink is going to be a huge category because, you know, that's con- remember constellation poured $4 billion into canopy growth. I don't think it was so they could sell joints and bongs. I think it was so they could figure out how to go develop a beverage in Canada because they could, they could test it up there and actually do the market research because it was federally legal in Canada so that when U.S. legalization happens, they can execute and bring everything to Florida or bring everything into the United States with a ready-to-drink category. Um, I'm sure selling cannabis is great, but having the next beverage that someone, you know, some of the beverages that have been tested in this space, very low calories, very low sugar, great time, no hangover. Sign me up. I'm in. Uh, I just think you're going to see – as more and more people use it, as more and more physicians get behind it, it's just like anything with more and more education and more and more physician adoption and people just trying it. I can tell you anecdotally, my wife was pretty much a no on cannabis, which, you know, I was, I was, I was banished to the garage. Like I was back in high school. Uh, and now, and now she is someone that's incorporated into, you know, she's a yoga teacher into her yoga practices and has incorporated it into her, you know, she's teaching three or four days a week. It's just a bit incorporated into her recovery. And, you know, instead of going out and having, we went to a music festival in Port Ardo Beach on Saturday. Instead of having 10 drinks, we took a, you know, half an edible each and had two drinks and had a great time and slept great. Mm-hmm. And it's more and more people that start to experience that there is a taboo because it's been federally illegal. And I think you're just going to see as more and more states adopt and you see this groundswell of support. I mean, if you would have asked me four years ago that we would have had the labor unions writing letters in support of cannabis legislation passing, I would have said There's, you're, you're smoking really bad weed. <laughs> And here we sit. It happened. It happened last week. So, well, Brady, um, can't thank you enough for your time. And I'll I'll turn it back over to Dan, but definitely keep us up. You know, I I know you're on Twitter and you send out information along with the other MSOS gang, which is out there doing a great job fighting the fight. So keep keep us posted and hope we'll have our day, man. Me too, guys. Thanks, Thanks thanks, Brady. Thanks, Danny, for jumping on. Guy Adami, any final thoughts? I know that you don't puff the magic dragon here, but um, listening to Brady and Danny talk about it, it, from an investable standpoint, it just seems there's very new themes that really have the ability to grow, you know, over time into something that we can all really understand. And so this one is really kind of, it seems like there's some near-term catalyst. Constellation Brands to me was the na- one name that really was ahead of that curve. And if you're looking for not tail, like to tremendous potential tailwinds for a stock, it comes in the form of STZ, as my friends in the United <laughs> Kingdom say. I totally dig Brady Cobb. I'm, I'm sure that he is puffing the magic dragon in his garage. I am not, however. And listen, I got no, I got no issue with it. It's just not my scene, Dan. Not, it's not your bag. All right, listen, thank you guys for joining us. Just two things here. Check out our episode of On the Tape with Guy, Danny, and myself. It dropped on Friday. We had Ian Bremer from the Eurasia Group. We talked about geopolitical hotspots and kind of gave us a little bit of an outlook for 2022 there. That was a great conversation, and we broke down everything that went on in the markets. It's still really relevant today. Also, sign up. It's pinned in our um, spaces right here. For Guy and I on Wednesday, December 8th at noon, it's going to be a live 30-minute discussion hosted by FactSet. It's going to be a 2022 outlook with a couple of their experts there. So that's going to be really fun. The register registration link is in there. So thank you guys. Check out On The Tape Podcast. Thanks to CME for sponsoring this trading spaces. And thanks to all for joining. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Trading Spaces brought to you by CME Group. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter at underscore Trading Spaces and join our Twitter spaces every Monday and Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can also follow On the Tape in your favorite podcast store for new episodes every week.